All right, so good night, everyone. Uh, my name is John Grasse. I'm a co-founder and the CTO of Unbabel. Uh, and Unbabel is an artificial intelligence company, and we're building an artificial intelligence powered human translation layer. Um, if you saw Vasco's talk this morning, you see all the cool stuff that you can do with the API. And what I'm going to talk tonight is how, what happens behind the scenes so you can actually use the API with the characteristics that Vasco just mentioned. So before, in case you weren't here in the morning, so what are we trying to solve? We're really trying to solve a communication problem. So 75% of the world does not speak English. Uh, new people coming through the internet do not speak English. So if you're a business and you want to communicate with your users, you better start talking other languages. And this is why translation is such a huge market. It's currently a $34 billion market, and it's growing. And it's growing in a different way. So besides the traditional content that is translated, like uh, websites, legal documents, now you have like all these emails, user-generated content that people want to translate. Uh, and the reason that this is not being addressed yet is because you don't have the resources to do so. And here's the problem. Right now you have two solutions. You either use machine translation, which is cheap, fast, but the quality is very bad. Uh, you definitely don't want to send it to like any customer-oriented uh, document. Or you have professional translator, which is professional translation, which is very expensive, it's slow, and it doesn't scale. Let me give you an example. So this is an actual example taken from a JavaScript uh, blog where a user in Japanese is using Google Translate to communicate to the blog. And obviously this is a hand-picked bad example. Not everything is as bad. But so this is what he says. This is a question. English is faulty. Thank computer to translate to help. Sorry. And often the go time installer error is vomit. How many times like the wind, the pole, and the dragon? The insult to father stones. Please apologize for your stupidity. There are many thank you. So this is an actual example. This came out of uh, the translation system. And I assume that none of you is actually going to send this to a customer if you're going to communication. Another example is customer support. So if you're doing business uh, on the web and you have customers from all over the world, you're bound to get emails in different languages. And right now what happens is you either have an agent that knows how to speak the language, or you basically can't reply on that language. And one of the problems is, given the current uh, price per word, one single email of 150 words will cost around $50. And although you do want to talk in the customer's language, it's not, um, the content is not valuable enough to pay for this price. The other problem is like translation, regular translation and by translation agencies is super slow. And you don't want to add this time on top of like your customer support time. So where did Unbabel start? So we started Unbabel, me and some other of the co-founders have a background on natural language processing and machine translation. And we're always talking about, okay, how is this problem not solved? And then we come up with the idea that if you actually look inside of the machine translation engine, a lot of times he knows the correct answer. So in this case, he's just confusing the word, uh, the word free, has in free of charge or is available. And if you could just switch that small bit of the translation process, then the translation will be completely perfect. And so we start thinking, okay, so maybe with this you can like build some really cool interfaces and have people correct the translations really fast, hence making it much faster and uh, cheaper. On the other hand, another problem that we have is that you don't have enough professional translators for the content that is being created nowadays. So Francis Hawk on 2012 was the responsible for Google Translate. And he says that like Google translates in one day more content than all the professional translators can translate in an entire year. So you see there's like these two problems that you have to tackle. And so what's our vision? So on one hand, we want to improve the technology. So if you had perfect machine translation, then translation would be free and super fast. If you don't have, if you have to start from scratch, like, like a regular translator, then it's going to be very expensive and time consuming. So basically, we're all walking on that curve and trying to walk towards perfect MT. On the other hand, if you only use professional translators, uh, they're very expensive. Basically, they're crafting a translation. They're very good. They're essential for some types of content. But for translation emails, maybe you don't need that kind of expertise. And as you start coming down, and if you, if you could use monolingual speakers, then it would be much cheaper. Uh, we're not there yet. We actually use monolingual speakers for a part of the process. 
but we still rely on bilinguals, but we don't require professional translators. So this is how we do it. So basically, you get the text. It comes in. We have a preparation step where we run a bunch of tools, remove the text. We see where are the entities, like name, locations. Uh, we process glossary words, and so on. Then we pass it through the translation pipeline, which I'm going to detail a little bit in the next slides. We then check to see what's the quality of the resulting translation, and if we do need to pass it by humans or not. Then we send it to the distributed translator, where you, translation, where humans can work either on the web interface or on the mobile. And we keep checking for the quality. So we, if we're not satisfied, we send it to another human, and so on, until we're satisfied, and then we produce the final output and we send it to the client. Um, so what's a translation pipeline? So this is where the interesting stuff starts happening. So basically, we get a text. The first thing we look for is translation memories. This is like some very old technology where if you already translated that piece of text, that sentence, exactly the same one, then just replace it. Uh, of course, the coverage that we have from that is super small. Uh, and then after we do that match, we send it to our own machine translation engines. Uh, and we have our own because since we're producing this data, we can train our own machine translation engines and hence increase the performance as I'm going to show it. And after that, we still have another step where we do automatic post-editing. And here the effort is, given that we're tracking what the editors are doing when, every time they correct a the text, then we can train an algorithm to do the same. And what we realize is that it's easy to train an algorithm that can fix some of the systematic errors that machine translation produces. And then we send the text to the human crop. And this is pretty cool because basically what we're saying is like the more words pass through in Babel, the better we get because we're getting this like self-fulfilling loop. So we have a text, we do machine translation, a human corrects it, and we get extra data to train the machine translation, and we get extra data to train the automatic post editing. So what do I mean with like our own customized MT? So Google, Bing, Yandex, they try to be this like general domain machine translation. So they're good for everything. You can throw at them any text, and they'll perform the best they can. Uh, the problem is like they're not super good at any particular context because they have to learn all these different uh, scenarios. On the other hand, if we train a particular machine translation engine, let's say just to translate customer tickets, then the type, the type of vocabulary and the type of uh, sentences and grammar that you'll find are very similar. So hopefully you can do much better than just using Google Translate. Here's some examples. If you actually go to Google and type this, this is what you get, we'd be happy to help. Uh, this is a particular example for a particular customer where you can see that our translation is much closer to what they want. And in fact, if you compare like the performance on Google on the subset of like the tickets and how Unbabel performance has been evolving, you see that we're already better than Google for this particular domain. And our goal is to basically train these engines for different domains. And you can see these results for uh, different languages. OK, so this is a very important part of the technology. Another important part is the quality estimation. And the goal here is I'll give you like a source sentence and a machine translation, and you have to tell me, is this good enough? Can I send this to the, to the client? Or is this completely crappy? I have to start from scratch, or I only need to have some minor edits. And this is like very much cutting edge research. So this started like being done actively on research like four years ago. I think we're probably one of the first ones that are uh, using it commercially. Uh, we won the competition of the best quality estimation system this year. Uh, and this basically, there's two main levels. So one is like word level quality estimation, where you try to see which words are well translated or not. Or sentence level that just tells you, is this sentence OK or not? And again, the way you train it is you have the source sentence, you have the machine translation, and you have the final post-edit sentence. And basically, you're trying to detect based on like how many changes were made. So again, you can see that we can learn the more that we have, the better we can improve the system, the better we can get better at the quality estimation. Right now, the way we use it is we have at least two editors touching the text. And if quality estimation is good enough, we skip one. We're not confident enough to skip entirely. And the reason is that all these things that I told you about, they work at a sentence level. So if you're actually translating like a paragraph, you might have like perfect translations for each sentence, but they're not consistent. So we always have a second person to give us the consistent. Uh, and also, this only works for machine translation. These methods don't work yet if you have human output corrected. Uh, but still, it's like a, a big improvement in terms of uh, space and time. OK, so I told you how do you get to like the first text. 
uh, but then there needs to be humans that actually go there and fix the errors. So let's go to that part. So we're supported on the bilingual community that currently has around 45,000 users. And they split, so we start with the testing phase where we're basically just explaining to the editors how they use the platform. Then after they get in, they go to a training phase where they have to do a bunch of tasks. They're not paid, we don't charge for those tasks. And they get evaluated by the higher members of the community. And then eventually they'll become a paid translator. Uh, paid translators can be demoted any time if the quality is not good enough and they get paid by hour. So the, uh, the hourly rate can increase depending on their speed and quality. And then the best of the best does our like, expert layer. Uh, also another dimension that I'm not talking here is like the domain. So what domain is each editor good at translating? So here's an example of like, how we evaluate a text from a translator. So we ask a senior one to come here, see the translation, rate uh, from one to five stars. With this we get a rating for a particular editor and then he can become paid or not. So, okay, I just told you how do we actually build these communities, and now we have a lot of people. So, in fact, we have people that are very different. And the question is, how do you pick what editors do which task? For instance, if I have to translate a soccer text, um, then a football text, sorry, uh, then that's actually easy because I don't know the terminology. Although if I have to translate something about parenting, it's much harder because I don't know how the terms get translated. So the way we tackle this is, let's assume that we have all these different texts through the Tetan Babel, and on yellow I'm showing what was the time that they got into the platform. And we have a bunch of editors that are available at that particular moment to do the task, and they're going to ask the platform, give me a task to do, and we have to decide which task are we going to deliver to them. So every task has a different SLA. So for instance, if it's a customer service ticket, we have to take around 20 minutes if it's a big project, we can take three days. And together with the time that are already on the platform and the time that we have to deliver to the client, we can organize, we can give a priority for each text, and we can organize in what we call a green queue and a red queue. Red queue means we're super late. Whoever is a paid editor and can do the task, please just do it now and let's submit it. We're jeopardizing some of the quality, but we really need to do it. On the other hand, if it's on the green queue, then we can play a little bit more. So for instance, we can look at the rating of the editors and say, okay, while we have time, we're going to wait for the best editors to take the job. Or we're going to demand that only a native on the target language can do the job. And this actually increases quality a lot, but we can do better. If we actually know what's the topic that the text is talking about, then we can actually use the topics and assign the right person to the right text. And this is not yet on production, but we run some experiments where if we use, like, without the topics, just like the selection that I showed you, we got an average rating of 3.8, while when you start adding the topics, you can improve the rating just by picking the right person. So this is very promising, so I told you, okay, so this is how we actually build this community. Now that we have a text, this is how we pick the editor, and now what does he do? And then we come to the interfaces, which is a super important uh, part of the process. And we believe that uh, the future is on the mobile, because if you want to get the uh, scale and the speed, you need to be able to notify someone on the mobile take that mobile and do the job. Also kind of the vision was you have an Erasmus student that's on the subway and on his way home he can just like do some unbevel tasks really fast, make enough money for a beer. Um, and so we come up with an interface where basically you, split, you chunk the text into pieces and this is what we call phrases and then you basically just drag and drop to the correct position on the target language. Uh, if you're not happy with a particular translation you can just hold and select the other option. Uh, and this ties together with what I showed you from the search graph for the machine translation. If only we had a way that you could pick the right node, the translation would be perfect, no more work was needed. And then basically you get a wonderful amount of feedback, which is like what are the users doing that allow us to train even better algorithms. And if you want to see a demo of the mobile, you can actually ask a phone so that's here at the end of the talk. Okay, so I told you how do you get the community, how do you pick the correct editor? Where do they work? But still, they're bilinguals. So despite our best effort, they're still not professional. So what can we do to help them to make them produce um, professional quality? Hence the smart check. So think about this as like the grammar correction on Word on steroids for 23 languages. So basically, basically what we have is like a set of texts that go from like spelling, tone, formality, consistency, and a bunch of client-specific rules uh, and what we try to do is like, given a text, 
try to detect what errors are there and where the errors are located and show them to the editors. And we don't have to be 100% sure because there are still going to be humans. So we just have to highlight them. They can ignore them if it's not correct. But what we want is for them to see. And this is particularly important because one phenomenon that we already saw at Babel is that there's the human error. So given the profession, give the professional translator 20 hotel descriptions to translate with the same error. He's going to correct it the, for the first four times and then his brain is going to start ignoring it and the error is going to go through to the client. So this is how you can actually like underline and call his attention. Because if you actually went back to him and say, there's an error here, he's like, oh sure, how the, how the hell did I forgot this? So this is an example of the smart check. So you see the underline, you click on top, it tells you on this case it's a spelling error, you can pick the right option or you can ignore it. This is like more of a, um, how should you write? You should write with digits, not letters. Or shouldn't using a backslash or avoid subjective terms. And then you can think of like a consistency, like you use the, you translated this noun differently on different parts of the text. Or the gender of the verb does not agree with the gender of the noun. And so on. And again, and this is the good thing about Unbabel, so we have all these algorithms going along. And then we have our more senior editors that go to the jobs that we do and annotate the errors. Very systematically, it's just a small sample. And this gives us two things. One, it tells us how good we are on quality. So you can actually say, okay, this is how we're improving on quality to our customers, to ourselves. And on the other hand, it gives us training data. So you can actually train these algorithms and uh, get better. So basically, I think we're there. So if you look at the translation industry, on average, people take around six hours to, translate, to return a translation. And right now, for an email, we're getting it around 20 minutes. And this is where we are right now. And we're getting close to do almost real-time chat. So try to do chat in less than one minute or two so that, for instance, you can be interacting with your customer on Facebook and have a customer experience, customer success experience with them. All right. Thanks a lot. Questions? Sure. Shoot it. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very nice. Um, I have a question. I, I, saw, I saw this week uh, Google's uh, keynote about, made by Google where they're talking about machine translation and what they envision for it. And they talk about the success they're having with a neural uh, machine translation that they mm -hmm. did from uh, Chinese to English. Is that something that Mbabel is thinking about pursuing uh, or, or not? Uh, sure. So there was a, um, basically neural machine translation in the last year catch up with the statistical machine translation. And it's basically now a fact that it's better than phrase-based machine translation, which is a previous approach on a lot of different scenarios. There are some unsolved issues, for instance, in practice, when you do a translation, you need to have glossary terms. These are words that the client wants to have uh, that are not the most usual translation, but they want to keep it, like PIN on Pinterest. And NeuralMT does not know how to deal with that. It's an unsolved problem how to simply copy one thing from the source to the target. Uh, but yeah, so we have an active research group called NBevelX uh, with three or four PhDs working, uh, and we're actively seeing how we can switch to that uh, NeuralMT. But again, the differences are big, but not as big as that. Uh, that was kind of a marketing stunt. It's okay. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>